What is up you guys? Thank you again for stopping by the channel once again. For those of you who don't already know, my name is Eric. Welcome. In today's video, let's talk about why I decided to sell my RX-7 and what exactly brought me to that tipping point and what made me make that decision. The RX-7 for me was a major project of five years. It was a significant amount of time and just effort involved. I've always been pretty consistent with modding cars that I've owned, but none quite to the extent or degree that I did with this RX-7. And if you guys are interested in learning a little bit more about the car itself, uh, there's actually a Speed Hunters article which I'll link to in the description below. And of course I have my personal website which is called grandmighty.com. If you really wish to dig deeper, that's the epicenter of all the different information that I cataloged on this car. But if you don't have time to dig through the entire website, it's pretty long. You don't have to. I mean the first few articles will probably give you a good picture of the latest state that the car was in. And I think one of the more recent articles on the website has a current mod list which should probably give you an easy picture of what the car is about. But anyway, aside from all that, how could I just turn around and throw away this car and throw away all this time and effort? I know from the outside looking in or on paper, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, if you look at me now, I basically went from this RX-7 and I'm driving a 1980s Toyota economy car that's also currently in pieces. So basically when I sold the car and moved on, I think I left some people thinking that I was impetuous or a combination of that and being a total idiot, which may be true, but hold on. Allow me to try and rationalize and verbalize all the different variables in play that eventually and ultimately culminated in my decision to sell this RX-7. I mean, it wasn't just like a black and white choice. There's definitely a lot of stuff that I had to consider. And I think this is going to be kind of a weird and touchy subject because I'm basically going to try and make sense out of something that is kind of abstract and very subjective in its nature. But let's give it a shot anyway. So first, let's rewind the tape back five years to July of 2011 when I first picked up this RX-7. At the time, I had just come off of uh, going through a bunch of random cars that I wasn't too happy with. So I was really looking to get myself back into like a major project. And ever since I left my first RX-7, which I'll show a picture of here, I felt some sort of gravity at that time that pulled me back into the RX-7 world. I couldn't really explain it, it's kind of like an intangible pull. I think I just missed the overall package of the car itself and the familiarity that I had with it. And this time around, I was really particular about the specs that I wanted for this RX-7. A lot of the discontent that I had with my first RX-7 was that it was a touring package. It was Montego Blue. It had a tan leather interior, which was nasty. Uh, it had a sunroof. And I think the sunroof really killed the lines of the car because the FD has a nice double bubble roof. And just having that sunroof right in the middle just was super distracting to me. So this time I said to myself, if I want another FD, I had to be really strict with the criteria. So I said it had to be either a white car or a black car and had to have no sunroof. So with those requirements, you basically filter down the list only to either a white base model or a black base model slash R1 slash R2 car. Eventually it took some time, but I was able to find the RX-7 that I wanted, which ended up being a black R2 model, which was on the East Coast. So when I found the car, I basically just bought it sight unseen uh, and had it shipped to me. And the shipping took actually two plus weeks to get to me when it was supposed to only take one week. Three fourths of the way into the shipping, actually, uh, I lost communication with the transporter for some time. And the last I heard was the truck broke down near the Mexico border around Arizona. So I thought, I thought I was screwed. All sorts of scenarios were running through my head. You know, I thought El Chapo took my car. Is the transporter even alive? Did the cartels behead them? But as sketchy as that situation was, it turns out that the truck just broke down uh, and the transporter subcontracted another transporter to bring the car up to me. So it eventually got into my hands, of course. So once the car was in my hands, safe and sound, I remember on day three, I turned it around and dropped it off to the paint shop and had it completely resprayed. Things just kind of snowballed from there. Right from the onset, I set my main objective to go out there and try and build myself the cleanest possible street FD that I could according to my own dreams and just to my capacity. I was able to maintain a pretty good consistency with its progress, but the reason why it took so long, the reason why it took five years was because I had to redo so many things. I just kept trying to do things over and over and over again to try and get things right. For example, the interior itself, I went through three completely different phases for it. I remember at one time I was refinishing the coating on some of the plastic and I had to repaint them 10 times from three different body shops to finally get it right. If you just look at the front bumpers, I went through three brand new 99 OEM spec bumpers. Before the third bumper, I gave up and went back to a 93 bumper and also had that repainted. And that was because at certain angles and also because the car was black, I noticed a certain little tiny protrusion on the edge of the bumper itself where it meets the hood. So I think I was a little bit crazy about how I was trying to be so strict about getting certain things just dialed in. Going back to the original dissatisfaction I had with going through so many different cars, I was just tired of it. changing cars as a hassle. 
Uh, I basically wanted to try and master a subject rather than spread myself thin over multiple subjects. So I had a really burning desire to just settle down, try to dig in, and just focus on one thing. And with that mentality, I basically put the stake in the ground and told myself that I would try to build this car for myself and just try to keep it. And that's really why I was so uncompromising with the scope of this project. And therein lies a fallacy. Nothing is permanent or forever. I think we're all familiar with this ideology. It's often romanticized, but not frequently realized. But kudos to those of you who are able to put this into practice. I know there's those of you out there that are able to hold on to a car for a long period of time. You guys are far more patient than I. I don't want to take anything away from you. I'm actually jealous. But anyway, I was able to keep that self-contract and agreement up until about a few months ago. But of course, you guys know how that turned out. I won't belabor the point. I think when you kind of hold that type of outlook, it really is a on or off type of switch. So tying back to that proverbial light switch and why it was flipped and I did a 180, the root cause of the problem is when you have just one car. You keep iterating on that one car over and over and you keep trying to make it better and better when it doesn't actually have to be. If I go do things all over again, I would probably put a stop at when it was in the single turbo phase. I think at that point it had just the right amount of mods, it wasn't too much and it wasn't overdone. So at the end of all that, I was basically left with a car that I spent an immense amount of energy on. It did give me a lot of satisfaction in the sense that I was able to kind of obtain this objective that I set forth for myself in the beginning, but it also gave me a sense of paranoia. I mean, the car was relatively low mileage. It only had 23,000 miles on it when I bought it. The paint job was immaculate. It had like no rock chips. I was always worried about driving it out and getting, you know, door dings or having somebody just bump into my fender. So instead of having a car that I could drive, I was basically left with an ornament and I always had this like weird cloud above my head whenever I took it out. And another thing, five years with something is a long period of time. I mean, thoughts and styles can really evolve and change. The whole underlying motivation of me even wanting this car to begin with stemmed back five years ago. But now going to current times, I no longer want just like a pretty street car. I don't want something I can just like, you know, cruise around to like mall parking lots or Starbucks or whatever and just try to pretend to be flossy. That got kind of boring. And I also don't want to spend 90% of my time just working on a car and trying to make things absolutely perfect. So what I want to do now is let all that stuff go, drop the pretentiousness and just start driving. I myself am from the Bay Area. We're fortunate enough to have a lot of nice back roads and tracks just in our immediate vicinity. But all that stuff has been totally underutilized by myself because instead of spending time being out there enjoying myself, I spent more time laying on a dirty concrete floor trying to install some part or something. So when I finished ironing out all the minor bugs, I finally said I was done and I took a step back at that point. I think that was the first time in a long time that I was able to finally breathe. So I took that opportunity to zoom out and just take a bigger look at the picture of things. That's really the point when I started to do some introspection and started weighing the pros and cons. And I basically looked at what I was using the car for, what it gave me so far, and I conclude that its aforementioned flaws would be terminal. I think reaching for high goals when building a car is great, but it's not right when it's disproportional to the amount of time you're actually getting to use it. Just to put things into perspective, uh, I owned the car for five years, and in that time I only put about 3,000 miles on the car. And most of the time I was honestly just driving back and forth to various shops, I went to the body shop like a billion times. So that meant the only way I could really move on was to sever my ties with this RX-7. Nonetheless, it was still a tough call, but it's just one of those things where it's better to just let go and then try to move on. Sometimes you have to close the door to open up a new door. Anyway, hopefully that frames my thought process and shows you my journey up until now. So fast forward today, I am working on this A86. I am doing a major push to get this thing done, but I'm actually approaching it with a completely different mindset. My goals are totally different, my intentions are different, and I have a more relaxed criticality to it. So with all that, it grants me the freedom to finally, hopefully start driving and achieve what I'm really trying to achieve. I'm still doing a lot to the A86, obviously, but at the same time, I also learned my lesson and I'm holding back on certain things. I mean, like, I'm not going to Alcantara wrap the entire interior like I did with RX-7. Hopefully you guys found this experience of mine interesting. Think what you will, extract from it what you will, but I just hope that it can provide some meaningful insight in your own endeavors. So the bottom line is to keep the moral of the story concise. It's a blessing and an opportunity to be able to dive into a project and just give it your all. But before you commit to something like that, my recommendation is really try to figure out the scope and direction for this project as early as possible. I mean, try to extrapolate yourself in X amount of years. For example, do you still see yourself driving a stripped out track car in X amount of years? Or do you still see yourself driving this perfectly glossy and slammed show car? I think the key is to always equate a goal with a function and factor that over time. And again, the irony of wanting something too much is that its rewards are actually diminished. I mean, nobody really cares about how clean your car is if it never sees daylight outside of a garage. And just as a small plot twist at the end, I will probably admit to something. Uh, the LS swap may have had a little bit to do with my decision as well. However, I promise to touch on that subject in a totally different video. So with that said, that's all I have to say. 
Thank you guys for watching. And in the next video, I'll put out the footage that I recorded during my last few moments with this car while I was waiting for it to get picked up by the transporter. Until then, peace.